Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at ANSYS today with Zhao Jiata, who's going to talk today about electrical overstress and aging. Zhao, what is electrical overstress? So, electrical overstress are all of the conditions in a design where applied voltage causes bad things to happen. Uh, and there's a taxonomy, there's a collection of these things that we break down. When did this start becoming a problem? Was it always a problem? Did it happen at 28 nanometers? Or is it really something that's happened in a 10.7? So, curiously enough, electrical overstress uh, is always been around, but it's tended to be confined to largely board level stuff and analog domain chips. It is now at the higher level of integrations at advanced nodes, when all of these functions are migrating on board into the, the single SOC, then it's become very important to tackle them at the SOC level. Effectively, modern SOCs are what a board used to be. Why don't you draw this out for us? Sure. What have you drawn out here? So, um, let's start on this side. This is basically a taxonomy of electrical overstress effects. So, electrical overstress is both kind of the generic umbrella term and then one of the specific subcategories. Um, within EOS, we have EM, electromigration, that is what happens to metal when it's subjected to high current loads and high voltages. There's ESD. These are momentary short events of very high intense energy that propagate into a chip and need to be dissipated. And then there's the subcategory of itself, EOS, which is what happens to transistors that are within normal operation of a design that they are exposed to more voltage than they are able to tolerate for high periods of time. So this is what happens when you're turning uh, circuits on and off all the time, right? And you're flooding them with, with higher voltages than what they're expecting or, or even current uh, stable voltages? Uh, yes to all the above. It also things that may happen through errors in the design. Um, most modern designs have multiple voltage islands, they have sensor inputs, they have uh, physical interfaces, and so there's regions that have to tolerate high voltage communicating with normal uh, logic functions that only operate at low voltages. And you have to make sure that under all possible operating conditions, the low voltage parts of the design are never exposed to high voltages beyond their tolerances. So where does aging fit into this? Aging is what happens when the dielectric is stressed, but not sufficiently to break it. So the first three categories are all things that fundamentally terminate the chip. Aging is what happens when you apply stress, but it doesn't break the chip, it just degrades its performance. Um, most modern uh, advanced processor nodes the performance will degrade if a transistor is exposed to a constant stress. And so aging is a measurement of how performance shifts over time due to stress. This becomes more of a problem as we start getting into things like autonomous vehicles, right? Because now you have a, a, a design that may not work properly or may not work as, as it was designed, but at the same time, it's not bad enough that it completely fails. Absolutely. Um, so it's extremely important in a number of domains. Uh, so one domain is ADAS with fault tolerant uh, and safety critical aspects. So it has to, across its entire lifetime, and for ADAS chips, that is somewhere between 10 to 20 years, has to meet a minimum guaranteed performance because it's interacting with a real-time environment. There's another category of applications where aging matters, which is systems that have to have very long intervals between maintenance or where maintenance is nearly impossible. Um, so that could be you know, satellites uh, on one side, but many industrial applications, once something is installed, it can become extremely difficult to maintain. Even base, you know, uh, cell phone basebands, uh, the typical minimum required lifetime is 10 years for baseband equipment. So it has to meet its minimum performance guarantees over that expected lifetime. Is the goal here to design the chip so that it doesn't have these aging effects, or is it to add resilience into the design so that it can survive longer? Um, the traditional rule in industry, or engineering anyway, is that if you can't measure it, you can't fix it, you can't adapt to it. So the first step in adoption of these technologies is first 
see what impact these events have on the behavior of your design. Once you know what breaks and what doesn't break, then you can take corrective measures to make your design operate under its necessary guard bands or, or change the design approach that you use so it's not exposed to these events. Um, interesting thing that you mentioned there because for example one of the common things uh, we typically deal with power by one of the typical approaches to reducing power is clock gating so in a clock gating event you effectively turn off the clock to a portion of the design because it's not currently needed and that portion of the design suddenly goes static it doesn't change it's very good for power, but what the side effect of that, that normal you know, people who don't deal with reliability don't think about, is that this now applies a constant stress voltage to the static part of the design. This, under normal operation, all the voltage is coming and going, coming and going, and the stress is relieved. Uh, there's a recovery effect. But as soon as you clock it in this section of the design, the stress is constant. And this may be a long-term event if there's an interesting power savings. So does this get become more of a problem as we move into not only uh, 3D structures, uh, which are FinFetch today, potentially uh, nanowires and nanosheets in the future? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, one anomaly just from the technology not advancing, the stress is on the dielectric becomes stronger and stronger. Um, the typical dielectric at the moment is somewhere between one and two nano, uh, meters uh, um, thick. And so, you know, your typical applied voltage of, you know, one volt is approximately, you know, a billion volts per meter stress. You know, these dielectrics are an enormous strain. Uh, and there's also implicitly because on 3D uh, structures, the dielectric is completely encompassing, or I mean, in the nano archives, completely surrounding the wire. Self-heating, which is a dominant component in the stress-causing event, also becomes a significant concern. So you have to deal with all of these physics at the same time. So what impact does this have on design going forward? Fundamentally, it, this changes how you approach design. Design that needs to have reliability in mind uh, and fault tolerance needs to take slightly different approaches. You know, for example, you may not be as heavily dependent on clock gating, you may move to power gating instead. It achieves the same purpose, fundamentally with approximately the same cost, but it doesn't have the consequence of exacerbated aging. Uh, so, you're solving similar problems with similar performance constraints, but you have to use a slightly different tool set. We've been used to approaching this by adding margin into chips. That doesn't necessarily work as you move to advanced nodes because now you have uh, much tighter tolerances in terms of power and performance. If you add all that margin, you actually reduce the, the benefits of scaling. How do you get around that in the future? It's not even just the vanilla margin. The problem with margin is that it's misallocated. Um, most of the, the design is not even necessarily sensitive to aging. You know, there are many parts of the design that are going to be continuously active. They don't age all that much. The stress is being relieved. There are parts that are very sensitive because they're either power gated or clock gated or, um, or have temporary use modes. Like, you know, for example, the programmability line uh, is probably not going to be active all that much. So. You cannot apply a blanket margin. You have to have a simulation-based approach that is context-aware. It knows that a NAND gate that is being used in a gating context has a very different aging context and stress environment than the same NAND gate, technically, you know, in the cell uh, view of the world, that is in a um, data path. A typical clock gate, one of the inputs is always 50-50, but the other input is random and very rare. You know, the, if a good clocking and gating event happens rarely, but happens for a long time. That's the very same things that makes a clock gating event interesting makes it a problem for aging. And you have to be aware that this 
okay, has a very different aging environment than that game. So you need a set of tools and solutions that is deeply context aware, uh, which is beyond the traditional either margining or cell based solution. Let's roll back into EOS here uh, directly. What effect does this have on, say, sensors and, and some of the other components that we typically find in some of these new designs, like a, an autonomous vehicle? Sure. So as you start integrating more and more functionality into a single chip, you're starting to have many power domains and many voltage domains all coming together in a single environment. And you need to be able to make a formal proof that under all possible conditions, this system is safe. That Low voltage areas are never exposed to high voltage, and that all the transitions between these domains are safe, that they're never exposing a transistor to a stressing voltage that they cannot deal with. Is that reasonable? Can that be done, or is this sort of theoretical? Um, this is fundamentally, this approach has become very similar to static timing. Static timing is a formal proof that the Timing bounds of your system are within performance specs. Um, the US system is effectively a very similar pr formal proof that the voltage environment of your system is always within its acceptable boundaries. It's exactly the same type of technology applied to a different domain. And typically what we've been doing all the way through engineering of chips for many years is basically a set of proofs, right? But now we're getting a different set of proofs than what, what we've used in the past? Exactly. Um, so, up until recently, because EOS was not something that we thought too deeply about with chips, um, most people just ran topology checks. If there was a path that electrically connected a high voltage to a low voltage, you had a human being look at it. Um, and that was okay for the levels of integration we had then. Um, it's no longer feasible. You know, we don't want to waste engineers' time doing manual checks that can be fully automated. Uh, and if you have the engine capacity and you know the ability to simulate the electrical system of the chip and make a formal proof, then it auto, you know it removes that task that workload from an engineer, so he can actually go solve the interesting problems. And one of the things that's changed is we now have so much compute power and so much uh, memory that we can actually do these kinds of simulations that we've been doing almost much more accurately. That it's it's a lower level of abstraction than what you needed in the past, right? Absolutely. Um, so this is the, the wonderful thing, the new world of EDA, where we have elastic on-demand compute systems me, me, making use of server farms. And it turns out that the individual simulations you need to do are not actually that complex. So you just need to do a lot of them. And there is this available compute power in these cloud platforms to solve the problem in a very reasonable amount of time. Even typically, a US for a billion uh, instance design can be done in hours. Xiao Jiada, thanks for a great explanation of a really complex and interesting new, tr new shift in what's going on in chip design. Most welcome. This is a wonderful space to be in.